When most people go to the coast, they run straight for the ocean and ignore the rocky shore. But what people don't realize is that they are completely missing a whole ecosystem at those rocky shores. An ecosystem that is divided up into levels, and those levels provide homes to many creatures. Intertidal, or littoral zones, make up the coasts around the world. This biome is located where the sandy beaches meet the sea between the high and low tide zones. These rocky shores are exposed and submerged by the tides at least twice a day. Depending on where the coast is affects the temperature of air and water in the biome. Coastlines that are in the tropics are warmer, whereas Arctic coasts have cold water and air. The shape of the coast affects the intensity of the waves. The straight-lined coasts are hit more intensely by the water, but rounded coasts made of bays are usually calmer and the water isn't as rough at high tide. The intertidal zones can be broken down into four zones. The upper littoral zone, also called the splash zone, is only flooded during high tide and is exposed to the sun for the rest. Hardly any vegetation grows here and most organisms are prey for bird-like predators such as seagulls. The upper mid littoral zone is equally submerged and exposed, making temperatures less extreme. However, wave action is more extreme and more vegetation such as seaweed grows here. The lower mid littoral zone is where most vegetation grows. There is more energy here and the water coverage allows for sufficient light and a constant salinity level. The lower littoral zone, however, is where larger organisms start to appear that can only live in water and feed on the secondary consumers. Another important factor in a littoral biome are density independent factors. A factor that affects the size of a population independent or regardless of the population density. Abiotic factors, which are also called density independent factors, are factors in an organism's environment that are not alive. The factors can be temperature, light, water, nutrients, and soil. One of the biggest factors is water. Organisms have to have special adaptations in order to survive in intertidal zones because they are constantly being impounded by waves. As high tide rolls in, the organisms have to hold on for their life as waves crash around them. These organisms have adapted to living on the rocky shores in order to reproduce. Sunlight also plays a major role in the distribution of intertidal organisms. Because the waves roll in and out at least twice a day, there are long periods of time when the rocks are exposed directly to the sunlight and the sea. Organisms have to be able to breathe oxygen and survive the sun's deadly rays. Not only is it extremely hot, but in the littoral regions near the Arctic, organisms have to be able to deal with the ice-cold air that they can be exposed to along with the freezing water as the tides roll in. Saltinity is also a concern for this ecosystem. When the high salt concentrated water rolls out at low tide, water gets trapped in tide pools. This water then evaporates and leaves behind salt deposits. When it rains, the tide pools also collect water that dilutes the saltinity, so animals must adapt quickly to these salt concentrations. Another factor of the littoral biome are density dependent factors. These are factors that affect the size of the population that vary with the density. Density dependent factors typically involve biotic factors such as food, predation, disease, and competition. As the population increases, food becomes scarce, and predators such as birds and fish serve as competitors to the other organisms. This competition factor can make it difficult to find food and a safe spot on the rocks to hold on to. Other organisms are a problem because they need to eat too. Many small organisms end up being eaten by the larger ones in the predator-prey relationship. Organisms such as phytoplankton, brown and red algae, and seagrass are all producers that make their own food through photosynthesis. These producers are then eaten by primary consumers 
such as mussels, clams, and barnacles. Secondary consumers include different types of crabs, but most abundantly, the kelp crab. Tertiary consumers include jewfish, different sharks, and sea turtles. Predator-prey relationships are common in this biome because that's how organisms eat. One relationship is between the shark and the jewfish. Sharks prey on jewfish, but this doesn't harm the ecosystem because jewfish take on the third survivorship curve. Survivorship curves show how organisms reproduce and their lifespan. The third survivorship curve is when an organism produces many offspring at one time. Most of them die quickly, but after they survive, they live to be long age. A second predator-prey relationship is between the sea turtle and sharks. Sea turtles also follow the third survivorship curve because they produce many offspring at once. Again, this does not harm the ecosystem because sharks eat some of the young. A common natural disaster that could occur in an intertidal zone would be oil spills. These destroy animals on the coastline because oil residue from the ocean hits the organisms on the rocks and kills them by cutting off their oxygen supply. After this kind of disaster, the intertidal zone would rebuild by waiting for the oil to become diluted by the water and the algae would start to grow again. After the algae grows, dispersion would introduce new organisms naturally by the order of the food chain. Human impact causes these natural disasters, and after a while, the biome could disappear because there would be so much oil it cannot be diluted by the water anymore. Pollution is also a major problem in this biome because the water becomes unsanitary for the organisms to live in. So the next time you're walking along the beach, be sure to look down to observe a naturally occurring ecosystem.